there. Happy Wednesday. I'm so glad that you're here today. We are going to have a great Wednesday. We are going to um, review days two and three of our um, ELA review. So I hope you brought that with you. Okay, that was in the notes um, on RenWeb today, uh, things that you needed to do. So um, you should have a colored pen with you and you should have your spiral ELA with you as well, because we're gonna check two and three. Okay, so go ahead and please get that out. And guess what else we're gonna do? We are gonna read some more of Little House in the Big Woods. So we better get busy so we don't run out of time. All right, I'm gonna share my screen with you for ELA, we're gonna do that first. So here we go. Oh, it's gonna make me get back in there again. Okay, guess we waited too long. So let me get this back up and running. And here we go. Get my camera back on, there we go. There's ELA right there. Right, so we, we've already done day one um, earlier in the week. So now we're just gonna do two and three. So let's get started. All right, on day two, number one, it says color the word with soft G blue and the hard G pink. Okay, we've talked about this in class before. Let's read the sentence. It says, the knight fought a giant dragon. Okay, if we look at the G's and night and fought, and they're both silent, so we don't hear any, any way of the sound of, of the night or fought, the G in those two words. So let's look at giant. I say J, giant. That's going to be your hard G. It's the sound that you hear right at the beginning of the word. So giant. So you should have colored that word blue. I'm sorry, you should have colored that one pink. The hard G is pink. So you could just kind of shade it in. You can do that, that works. And then let's look at the word drag gun, drag gun. Do you hear it as much? J, g, j, g. G is a softer, drag gun. So that would be your soft G. So usually you can figure that out just by saying the word out loud. And it's a good thing to say these words out loud. So you can actually hear yourself say the word. Okay, the next one. Write the possessive form of the noun in the picture. Okay, the noun in the picture is girl. That's a picture of a girl. And it is a person, so it's a noun says the blank shoes. Well, if we want the girl to own the shoes, which is showing possession, if I own something, I possess it. It's mine, right? It's in my possession. So that's why it's called a possessive noun. So the girl's shoes is what you should have put. Girls. So it'd have a G-I-R-L apostrophe S. You have to have that apostrophe in there because that shows ownership, okay? Ownership is when you possess or own something. It belongs to you or to her. The shoes belong to the girl. So you have to have that apostrophe S. Okay, finish the sentence with the comparative adjective. A tortoise is slower than a rabbit a tortoise is slowest than a rabbit. Well, let's, let's think about that. When I say that, if I say slowest, that doesn't even really make sense. It doesn't even sound right. A tortoise is slowest than a rabbit. We have to have slower in there. A tortoise is slower than a rabbit. You're gonna use slower because you're comparing the two, the two nouns. You are comparing tortoise to rabbit. So you're gonna use the comparative adjective, which is slower. Slowest, when you have the EST, um, that is called a superlative adjective. And we talked about that last week. So slower is going to be 
the comparative adjective. So if you circled it, it says to finish the sentence, which means they really wanted you to write it in. So you should have written slower. Okay, they'll tell you if they want you to circle something. The next one, match the picture to the correct synonym. Okay, if you remember, we have also talked about synonyms and antonyms a little bit. Synonyms are words that mean the same, but they are spelled differently. Remember, S and S, same synonym. So what means the same as sleepy? Well, you should have matched it to tired. Okay, sleepy goes with tired. Sleepy and tired mean the same. Make a compound word. Okay, you have a picture of a jar of jelly, a plus sign, and a fish. Put it all together, you have jellyfish. Okay, that's a compound word. Two words that are smashed together to make one word. So I'm gonna put jelly and fish together. Okay, all right, moving along day four, I'm sorry, day three, day three. Use these words to write a sentence using commas. Okay, so these are words like in a series, okay? So I'm gonna start a sentence where I'm using, putting all these words in it together because I'm gonna use, they want me to use commas. Okay, so I'm listing, basically I'm listing. So I'm going to say, I brought my blanket, comma, pillow, comma, and teddy, period, okay? I brought my blanket, comma, pillow, comma, and teddy. You still need a comma even before the word and, okay? So there should be two commas in your sentence and don't forget your period. It's a complete sentence. You gotta have one at the end. All right, the second one. Put the, ooh, I'm sorry. My, cam my camera's going, trying to focus on us. It says, put the words in ABC order by numbering one, two, three. Okay, so we are looking at the first letter. When you're putting something in ABC order, you always look at the first letter first. Well, in the alphabet, M comes before the S's, right? So one is going to be monkey bars. That comes in the alphabet first. Then we have to look at, the, we've got two S's here. So when you have two of the same letter, you need to look at the second letter. Okay, L and W. Well, in the alphabet, L comes before W, right? So that's gonna be my second, that's gonna be my second word. That comes next, and then last, swing with the W, okay? So one, two, three. All right, the next one, write two words that have the root word fair. Okay, um, you could say fairy, I could say fairy, and fairness, how about fairness? Okay, fairy, fairness. Fair is my root word in both of these. It's the word that can stand alone. It's the part of the word that can stand alone. It's my root word, fairy, fairness. Okay, match the word to the correct abbreviation. Okay, the month is December. I can, DCR period. Nope, that's not it. DEC. That's it. It says match. So I'm going to draw a line to DEC. 
DEM is not correct. In, in, in our language, we have DEC period as the abbreviation for December. Write the missing long vowel pattern to complete the word. You should have written light. That is a picture of a light bulb. So it's light. Okay, that is the long vowel. The I is long, but it makes the blend I-G-H. So that is the vowel pattern, okay? And it's a long I that begins the, the uh, blend, the pattern. So that's why that's correct. All right, boys and girls, I hope you did great on your ELA. And don't forget, you need to be correcting it in pen, okay? So Ms. Patterson and I can see what we need to work on. All right, I'm going to um, take away this screen and you see me again. So I'm gonna put my ELA away and I'm going to turn my iPad off there. And now we're just gonna do some reading. So I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to start off and we are on, okay, let me share this with you. Hang on just a second. Let me get my screen back up again so I can share it with you. There we go. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen now. And we left off on chapter one, um, page 12. So on page 12, I ended with the word bacon. Pa had just said, anyway, I saved the bacon because he had just tried to shoot the bear that was after the pig and he missed the bear. If you remember, he missed, but he saved the bacon, okay? He didn't shoot the pig is what he was, it was kind of a little joke. He was thinking he was joking with Laura. All right, so here we go. We're gonna start with the sentence right here after I save the bacon. It begins with the next paragraph. It's a second paragraph on page 12, the garden. Okay, we're gonna start there. I'm gonna read along in my book, but you can watch the screen and follow along with me, okay? The garden behind the little house had been growing all summer. It was so near the house that the deer did not jump the fence and eat the vegetables in the daytime. And at night, Jack kept them away. Remember, Jack is her dog. Sometimes in the morning, there were little hoof prints among the carrots and the cabbages, but Jack's tracks were there too, and the deer had jumped right out again. Now the potatoes and carrots, the beets and turnips and cabbages were gathered and stored in the cellar, for freezing nights had come. Remember, it was almost winter time and they had to save their food for the winter. They had to make sure they had enough, so they had to start storing uh, food away. And they would store it in their cellars and attics a lot of times back then in the pioneer days. Onions were made into long ropes braided together by their tops and then were hung in the attic beside wreaths of red peppers strung on threads. The pumpkins and the squashes were piled in orange and yellow and green heaps in the attic's corners. The barrels of salted fish were in the pantry and yellow cheeses were stacked on the pantry shelves. Then one day, Uncle Harry came riding out of the big woods. Oh, we are on the next slide, page 13. He had come to help Paul butcher. Ma's big butcher knife was already sharpened and Uncle Harry had brought Aunt Polly's butcher knife. Near the pig pen, Paul and Uncle Henry built a bonfire and heated a great kettle of water over it. When the water was boiling, they went to kill the hog. Then Laura ran and hid her head on the bed and stopped her ears with her fingers so she could not hear the hawk squill. Remember, she didn't like the sound. She, she would lay there and listen to all the sounds at night. We learned that at the beginning of chapter one. And she sometimes she'd get kind of spooked and it was kind of creepy outside. It doesn't hurt him, Laura, Paul said. We do it so quickly. But she did not want to hear him squeal. In a minute, she took one finger cautiously out of an ear and listened. The hog had stopped squealing. 
After that, butchering time was great fun. It was such a busy day with so much to see and do. Uncle Henry and Paul were jolly and there would be spare ribs for dinner. And Paul had promised Laura and Mary the bladder and the pig's tail. Ooh, I wonder why they wanted those two things, a bladder and pig's tail. Let's find out. That's really interesting, isn't it? As soon as the hog was dead, Paul and Uncle Henry lifted it up and down in the boiling water till it was well scalded. Then they laid it on a board and scraped it with their knives and all the bristles came off. After that, they hung the hog in a tree, took out the insides and left it hanging to cool. When it was cool, they took it down and cut it up. There were hams and shoulders, side meat and spare ribs, and the belly. There was the heart and the liver and the tongue and the head to be made into head cheese and the dish pan full of bits to be made into sausage. The meat was laid on a board in the back door shed and every piece was sprinkled with salt. The hams and the shoulders were put to pickle and brine for they would be smoked like the venison in the hollow log. You can't beat hickory cured ham, Paul said. He was blowing up the bladder. It made a little white balloon and he tied the end tight with a string and gave it to Mary and Laura to play with. They could throw it into the air and spat it back and forth with their hands. And you can see that in the picture. You can see what they're doing. It's kind of like a ball. They kind of used it as a ball. They didn't have balls like we do back then. You know, they didn't have, they couldn't go to the grocery store or any store, Walmart, Target, and, and buy balls to play with. So they would use the bladder of a pig. Okay, bottom of page 15. Or it would bounce along the ground and they would kick it. But even better fun than a balloon was the pig's tail. Paul skinned it for them carefully and into the large end, he thrust a sharpened stick. Ma opened the front of the cook stove and raked hot coals out into the iron earth. Then Laura and Mary took turns holding the pig's tail over the coals. It sizzled and fried and drops of fat dripped off it and blazed on the coals. Ma sprinkled it with salt. Their hands and their faces got very hot and Laura burned her finger, but she was so excited she did not care. Roasting a pig's tail was such fun that it was hard to play fair taking turns. At last it was done. It was nicely browned all over and how good it smelled. They carried it into the yard to cool it and even before it was cool enough, they began tasting it and burning their tongues. They ate every little bit of meat, bit of meat off the bones and then they gave the bones to Jack. And that was the end of the pig's tail. There would not be another one till next year. Uncle Henry went home after dinner and Paul went away to his work in the big woods. But for Laura and Mary and Ma, butchering time had only begun. There was a great deal for Ma to do and Laura and Mary helped her. See, they helped a lot back then. Children were expected to help with all the chores and even the cooking and even hunting. If you were a boy, you hunted with your dad. So they were very involved in what was going on. Okay, we're at the third, the second paragraph, all that day. All that day and the next, Ma was trying out the lard and big iron pots on the cook stove. Laura and Mary carried wood and watched the fire. It must be hot, but not too hot or the lard would burn. The big pots simmered and boiled, but they must not smoke. From time to time, Ma skimmed out the brown cracklings. She put them in a cloth and squeezed out every bit of the lard and then she put the cracklings away. She would use them to flavor Johnny cake later. Cracklings were very good to eat, but Laura and Mary could have only a taste. They were too rich for little girls, Ma said. Ma scraped and cleaned the head carefully, and then she boiled it till all the meat fell off the bones. She chopped the meat fine with her chopping knife in the wooden bowl. She seasoned it with pepper and salt and spices. Then she mixed the pot liqueur with it and set it away in a pan to cool. When it was cool, it would cut in slices and that was head cheese. The little pieces of meat, lean and fat that had been cut off the large pieces 
Ma chopped and chopped until it was all chopped fine. She seasoned it with salt and pepper and with dried sage leaves from the garden. Then with her hand, she tossed and turned it until it was well mixed and she molded it into balls. She put the balls in a pan out in the shed where they would freeze and be good to eat all winter. That was the sausage. So Ma was making cheese and sausage and cracklings for seasoning. She was starting to prepare foods that she could um, store away and they could go and get when they got hungry in the winter. So she's making lots of things and um, the girls are helping her. When butchering time was over, there were the sausages and the head cheese, the big jars of lard and the keg of white salt pork out in the shed and in the attic, hung the smoked hands and shoulders. So they put things in certain places where they would be best kept. Okay, so some things specifically were hung in the attic and some things were in the shed and it depended on how they had to preserve them as to where they put them in the house. So it was, they very carefully thought about this before they stored their food away. All right, now let's go to page 19. The little house was fairly bursting with good food stored away for the long winter. The pantry and the shed and the cellar were full, and so was the attic. Laura and Mary must play in the house now, for it was cold outdoors, and the brown leaves were all falling from the trees. The fire in the cook stove never went out. At night, Paul banked it with ashes to keep the coals alive till morning. The attic was a lovely place to play. The large round colored pumpkins made beautiful chairs and tables. Ooh, they made tables and chairs out of pumpkins. The red peppers and the onions dangled overhead. The hams and the venison hung in their paper wrappings and all the bunches of dried herbs, the spicy herbs for cooking and the bitter herbs for medicine gave the place a dusty but spicy smell. Often the wind howled outside with a cold and lonesome sound, but in the attic, Laura and Mary played house with the squashes and the pumpkins and everything was snug and cozy. Mary was bigger than Laura and she had a rag doll named Nettie. Laura had only a corn cob wrapped in a handkerchief, but it was a good doll. You can see the picture there where they are sitting on the pumpkins as chairs. So they have to use their imagination, just like we should be using our imagination today, or you should be using your imagination when you play. So they, you can see there, Nettie is her doll, and Laura has a little corn cob that she is pretending to be um, a, a little doll. So she's pretending there. All right, let's go to the next one. But it was a good doll. It was named Susan. It wasn't Susan's fault that she was only a corn cob. Sometimes Mary let Laura hold Nettie, but she did it only when Susan couldn't see. The best times of all were at night. After supper, Paul brought his traps in from the shed to grease them by the fire. He rubbed them bright and greased the hinges of the jaws and springs of the pans with a feather dipped in bear's grease. There were small traps and middle-sized traps and great bear traps with teeth in their jaws that Paul said would break a man's leg if they shut on it. While he greased the traps, Paul told Laura and Mary little jokes and stories, and afterward, he would play his fiddle. The doors and windows were tightly shut and the cracks of the window frame stuffed with cloth to keep out the cold. But Black Susan, the cat, came and went as she pleased, day and night, through the swinging door of the cat hole in the bottom of the front door. She always went very quickly, so the door would not catch her tail when it fell shut behind her. So they now have a little cat too, and it's called Black Susan. And in the, um, right here in the picture, you can see Paul greasing the bear traps so that they'll be, um, they'll open and close very easily. Okay, you wanna grease them or they would get, I guess, old and rusty and stuck. They wouldn't move very well. So one night when Paul was greasing the traps and we're reading again, now we're on page 23. 
He watched Black Susan come in and he said, there once was a man who had two cats, a big cat and a little cat. Laura and Mary ran to lean on his knees and hear the rest. He had two cats, Paul repeated, a big cat and a little cat. So he made a big cat hole in his door for the big cat, and then he made a little cat hole for the little cat. There Paul stopped. But why couldn't the little cat, Mary began. Because the big cat wouldn't let it, inter Laura interrupted. Laura, that is very rude. You must never interrupt, said Paul. But I, but I see, he said, that either one of you has more sense than the man who cut the two cat holes in his door. Then he laid away the traps and he took his fiddle out of his box and began to play. That was the best time of all. All right, and boys and girls, that is the end of chapter one of Little House in the Big Woods. Next time we will begin chapter two and it's called Winter Days and Winter Nights. So thank you for reading with me today. Don't forget to check your assignments for today. And I believe you have a paragraph that you were, are supposed to write about if you were in a wagon traveling with your family, what two things would you take with you and tell us why, okay? All right, I'll see you next week. Have a wonderful Easter. Have a great weekend. Bye.